There we That's go. You. We did That's it. You. Okay, perfect. And that helps us all know that we're being recorded. So uh, yeah, there you watch go. Your as you're talking. Um, let me um, let me get the uh, official uh, thing on the chat screen that welcomes everybody. And uh, uh, Dr. Schlossberg, welcome. Glad you joined us. Kathy and Sarah, welcome. And uh, so we have with us uh, Molly Wilkins, who's going to be uh, speaking with us. I'm going to give it over to her to give her as much time as possible to talk. And so she'll introduce herself a little bit more and her topic. And, um, and what we'll do is at the end of her uh, formal presentation, we'll open it up to questions. And since there's so few of us, you can jump in on just uh, your audio or what you can do is also type in the chat space and I'll kind of keep my eye on that to make sure that she, you know, she gets those questions. So uh, hold on one more second, Molly, so that I can spotlight you and, and it is all yours. All right, uh, so I was very mindful of time because as we were talking a minute ago, I tend to speak just at will sometimes. So I actually recorded a Prezi. So I'll go ahead and play that for you guys. And um, it did kind of cut me off at the end. So I'll finish the last little bit live for you guys. So I'm about to hit share screen and then we'll get this started. So let's see, here we go. Does it show up for you guys? Okay, good. Hi everybody, my name is Molly McWilliams Wilkins and I am a graduate of the Communications and Leadership Studies program at Gonzaga University. And this is a presentation based on my thesis paper entitled, The Duality of the Southern Thing, How New Media is Providing a Paradigm Shift for the Semiotics of Southern Symbols. There are many symbols traditionally associated with the Southern United States. Often the argument has been made that these symbols are part of our history and should not be forgotten or tampered with. In these arguments over time, the original context and understanding of these objects have long been forgotten, with new meanings taking shape within the context of a larger Southern cognitive dissonance. Through interviews with thought leaders, this thesis presentation explores how the advent of new media Voices outside of what has been seen as the historical spectrum have been allowed to emerge in a vacuum created by 24-hour news cycles, thereby allowing for more discussion around the narrative and semiotics of these symbols and how they are presented within this new media. Patterson Hood, co-founder of the Southern band The Drive-By Truckers, wrote the song Three Great Alabama Icons. In it, he said, such is the duality of the Southern thing when referencing how Alabama Governor George Wallace would go from shouting on the steps of the University of Alabama to keep segregation to later winning office in 1982 with over 90% of the black vote. Hood would again reference this duality in his essay on the South for the Bitter Southerner, drawing upon the trucker's album Southern Rock Opera on which the three great Alabama icons was featured. It still haunts the South today. This duality is one that I live every day. Growing up, the matriarch on my mother's side of the family was his grandmother. She was a force to be reckoned with from what I was taught. I grew up hearing tales of how she stayed by my grandfather's side as he worked for the Alabama Railroad Lines and how she worked as a woman on political campaigns. In Alabama, there's never a shortage of Southern duality or what I also call Southern cognitive dissonance. This is displayed in my own family when I would later learn as an adult that this matriarch of my family worked for Governor George Wallace. Dr. Chenjerai Kumanika said in season four, episode 12 of Seen on Radio, one of the reasons that podcasts like this are experiencing a resurgence at the same time that people are in the streets is because I think people want real explanations of how we got here. And our current media environment isn't really great for that. It's about speed and this relentless onslaught of context and breaking news. But if we're going to solve the problems that we need to solve, we need spaces for a different kind of thinking, a certain kind of critical thinking space. So whether we're talking about the Senate or talking about policing, we can't transform institutions without understanding them. And that means understanding their history. 
New media forms have brought about voices that have been traditionally marginalized in the debate about Southern symbols and are forcing us to face the true meaning of these symbols, both in their original historical context, as well as how they have been and continue to be transformed over time. And pardon me, I'm going to go as quickly as I can, um, condensing a over 50 page paper into a 15, 20 minute presentation. Uh, but just to give a quick synopsis of my literature review and the theories covered, it covered the historical representation of Southern symbols and how they were established over time, but also how they've been represented in traditional media channels. The literature review examined how Confederate slash Southern symbols had been challenged in traditional media spaces. And then also conversely, the impact of new media and podcasts on communications was shown as well. The gap in current research does not show how this new media and podcasting space has affected how the general public perceives and is discussing Southern symbols and their effects. In examining the relationship between these two topics, we can better understand the importance of new media on having a more complete worldview on the issues surrounding Southern symbols and perhaps move towards racial understanding. The theories I used are displayed in the graphics shown here. We have Borman's symbolic convergence theory, Stuart Hall's cultural studies, and then next slide. So cultural approach to organizations, and then also the narrative paradigm of Walter Fisher. And something I'll also add is that with our habit of tailing verbal narratives, sometimes stories can get embellished. And I, I find that I see this in the South quite a lot. Um, my mom always said that you never knew how much of what my grandfather was saying was the outright truth or a story he embellished to make it better. The flip side of this, as well as entertaining in so many circumstances, we've also in so many circumstances literally whitewashed our own heritage. Uh, so for the sake of brevity, again, I will not be covering in depth the scope and methodology used in great detail, except to say that it included in this study were interviews with thought leaders on the topics of media and Southern studies, as well as an am examination of podcast reviews on the topics. Interviews were conducted via phone calls with follow-ups over email as needed. The study is limited to interviews with just a few thought leaders on the topic and publicly published reviewed, excuse me, publicly podcast, uh, publicly published podcast reviews. Excuse me, my goodness, red tongue twister. Uh, but further study can be conducted through surveys to the general public. Minimal risk was met by letting interviewees know that they were being recorded. Uh, so fantasy theme criticism was used as one grounding method for this research. And fantasy theme criticism is based within Borman's symbolic convergence theory and states that groups create their own reality. Here, those who have perpetuated the lost cause mythology have viewed their history through this lens, their own fantasy. Structural semiotics examines how artifacts can give clues to their meaning, and here was used to examine how Southern symbols uh, move from one meaning to another through actions of new medium. So for this study, I interviewed John Bewan of the Center for Documentary Studies at Duke University, Dr. David Davis, Professor of Southern Studies at Mercer University, my alma mater for my undergraduate, and Chuck Reese, founder of the Bitter Southerner website, and Ashley Hopkinson, Senior Editor for Gannett's American South website. Each of these individuals studies Southern culture as part of their profession. Bewan is the host of Seen on Radio, and their second scene was second season was titled Seeing White, and he co-hosted this with Rutgers University Professor of Communication, Dr. Chandra Kumanika, who I quoted earlier. The Seen on Radio Twitter account has nearly 4,000 followers, and Bewan admits that he is somewhat addicted to the platform. But more than that, he states that often Twitter is a place where Black voices can emerge in ways they may not have elsewhere, and that social media in general has allowed voices that have been traditionally marginalized to be amplified elsewhere. Uh, and sometimes you can also better find your own um, people who think the way that you do as well as there, which can add uh, security as well. Uh, something else he stated is that as a result of their series and through feedback through, from audience members, they often hear from listeners who thank them for exploring these topics and shedding light on the roots behind them. Often Black listeners have told him that they felt in their soul that there were reasons behind a particular event or cultural experience that the podcast allowed them to understand the meaning behind it. 
Beaman also reflected on his personal observations on podcasting and the intimacy it provides. After working in public radio for 30 years, he stated that radio people often cite how the medium creates intimacy between the broadcasters and the listeners, and that podcasting often imitates this. Ooh, excuse me. While interviewing David Davis, Dr. David Davis of Mercy University, something he said straight away was that the deaths of George Floyd, Ahmaud Arbery, and Breonna Taylor drew a lot of attention back to Confederate memorials and the general public, but that scholars had been studying them for ages, and that it's quite exciting as a scholar to see the general public take an interest in this topic and to see the recent eruption of interest. Allowing these symbols to stay up, according to Dr. Davis, is reinforcing Jim Crow and white supremacy. Sorry, pardon me. <laughs> Next slide. So Chuck Reese, founder of Bitter Southerner. This is an online magazine he started because of his own frustrations with how the South was portrayed. It's more than romanticized uh, pictures painted in so many places, more than magnolias and moonlight, so to speak. There's a darkness behind the pretty pictures. Reese stated that he believes we as a country are still grappling with white supremacy and everything that stems from it. There's a duality of this, not just in the South, but in the America as a whole. When the Bitter Southerner was started, it was just after responsive websites became common. So prior to that, if anybody remembers, I know I do, uh, you would have both a mobile website as well as a desktop site. And so you'd have to put content on both. But when you had a responsive website come out, it made it a lot more mobile friendly. And so people could then also access those websites through social media. So they also did not have a comment section on their website, they did that by design. So the comment section then transferred over to Facebook comments. And so social media was actually a big part of their growth. Let's see, sorry, pardon me, next slide. I don't know why I'm saying next slide out loud. I'm doing it myself. But um, so Ashley Hopkinson is the senior editor for Gannett's American South website. Gannett is the largest newspaper publisher in America, owning USA Today and other properties. So Hopkinson said the network, Gannett, decided it was a time to put a lens on the South. With that in mind, she also stated that one of the roles of journalists and journalism is to reflect on what is happening in the moment and issues at hand. So now we are protesting racial injustice, and this is not a new media response, but social justice forces us to reflect on our history. When pressed further about the role of social media in this, Hopkinson went further to say that she's been a journalist for 13 years, and while there has always been a sense of urgency in journalism, social media forces journalists to be even more pressed to respond once an item goes out. Is this tweet true? What's the story behind the Facebook post? Journalists must now contextualize what is placed out there in social media for the general public to understand. The role of the new press is to gut check what is put on social media. It's not a singular voice. You find yourself looking for new ways to serve your audience. And this way, social media has democratized these voices. Um, I did also look over podcast reviews as stated earlier. But again, I'm sorry for the sake of brevity. I will not get into those, but I will have a list that hopefully I will have gotten out ahead of time. Otherwise, I can send you one afterwards of the podcast I looked over and uh, links to those reviews as well. So the overarching thing that emerged from each interview and podcast analysis was that social media and new media formats are absolutely aiding and shedding new light on Southern symbols. This is being done with a thorough analysis of our history and discussing it through these forums. The social media allows the message to be spread to larger audiences, but also allows those audiences to find like-minded people easier. I used reactive sequence path dependency and historical contingency to help make these conclusions. These symbols and being allowed to be erected in public spheres of influence regarding Confederate monuments and flag and whatnot, they're allowed to have some measure of importance. We give them a gravitas when they are placed in prominent views of city halls and courthouses as if they are part of the law that is still in place today. This gravitas is unearned, but was crafted by the fantasy themes created by Confederates who lost their unjust war to keep slavery. In using social media and podcasts to discuss these topics, we can reshape the fantasy theme, which has kept their meaning alive. Here's where we see the danger of allowing the semiotics of these symbols to retain their current meaning. 
It's also important to make note of the delivery of this information. The social media and podcasts have allowed the public to consume complex information in more portable ways that coalesce with our busy lifestyles. The social media and podcasts are often delivered for consumption through mobile devices, making them easier to consume whenever the user desires. The barrier of entry is lower, with many people having access to a cell phone, and today's cell phones often having the technological capacity of some computers. We can also appreciate social media and new media for being more than just a tool for delivering fun memes or even for dividing us. These tools are here to better our understanding of the people who differ from one another. Language, symbol, signs, they're all forms of communication. By allowing Confederate symbols to have taken up public space for over 150 years after the Civil War, we as a society give them an agency that they shouldn't have. The social media and podcasts have allowed a public that had historically had their collective memory whitewashed to be exposed to a changing semiotics of these symbols and has happened in a vacuum created by a need for better news coverage in the wake of the evolving 24-7 news cycle of more pundits and less true analytical news coverage. I do believe that there should be further study on this topic, both with interviews and interviewees, with other thought leaders, and by studying more podcasts. It would also be interesting to see how COVID-19 has affected this once we are further removed from this period of our time. In conclusion, new media, including podcasts and social media, and the speed with which it moves are often blamed for the problems our world faces today. Greater differences and arguments amongst peoples and a lack of vetting sources. But it's really just a mirror that provides a lens into who we already are. This new media itself is simply a tool that is operated by humans who have been storytellers from the moment we were created, whether it was with clay on a cave wall or through. Uh, so again, it cut me off like at the very end of my conclusion. So I'll, I'll just finish that up uh, here very quickly for you guys. Basically what I was saying is that people today are wanting an explanation for just how we've gotten where we are. Like what Dr. Chenjirai Kumanika said in, in my introduction that I quoted, social and new media are allowing us the chance to find that truth, here specifically in regards to Southern symbols and their true meanings. The interviews and podcast review research I conducted concluded that new media does, in fact, help give greater awareness to the true history of Southern symbols, thus allowing their semiotics, or the way they are viewed, to change. So... Thank you very much. I hope I Thank was you. mindful of your Thank time. You. Uh, <laughs> Molly Wilkins, who's presenting uh, just an excellent uh, presentation. And I, I want you to teach me how to do that with Prezi as well. That was very, very cool as well. I will tell you guys, I, the reason why I didn't bother doing it again is because I had been at my computer for like three hours trying to figure out, okay, here's how it worked work with the PowerPoint. Mm, that's not gonna work. Cause I wanted to videotape and have the slides. Then I said, okay, I'll try Google Slides. Nope, didn't work either. Tried iMovie. That didn't work. And so, and then the original cost for Prezi was like $180 for the year. And I was like, I'm not paying $180 for a year. And then I figured out there's an education rate and that was like 30 bucks. So I was like, whatever, I just want to get it done. Yeah, those education rates always save me as well. So yes. <laughs> I'm going to remove you from the spotlight and that way everybody can, you can see everybody and we can see you. And uh, if you want, if there's questions for Molly, uh, you can put them in the chat room and I'll try to take a look at that. And otherwise just blurt out your question in audio and we'll, we'll uh, elbow each other to get in our questions. Not all at once. <laughs> Um, one of the things I was my... thinking, oh, go ahead, please. So, sorry, I, I'll just unmute myself because I don't actually know how I want to um, like fully form this question, but I loved when you were talking about barriers of entry um, to this information and how the fact that these things are now so accessible has made this information feel more consumable to people. And I was thinking about how people who have the knowledge, or, or not the knowledge, but the experience to be able to, and the removal from Confederate symbols or other Southern symbols to be like, well, of course, this is a bad thing. 
how come no one else understands that, that that might, how that limits someone's willingness or ability to learn because it's immediately shaming rather than a form of education. And do you feel like this, this is sort of a component of removing those barriers of information by making the information feel accessible, making someone feel like they're the, the, the agent of their own learning rather than having to be corrected by someone outside of them and how that might influence someone's willingness. So I think, I, I think I get what exactly what you're saying. I think you have to be willing to seek out that information. Um, these mm -hmm. are conversations I've had a lot lately. It's conversations I even have with, within my own family. Um, it's always kind of interesting and awkward when you've got family members who are like, oh, it's just honoring our Confederate dead. Okay, well, did you realize that um, those monuments initially were actually put in cemeteries and then they were very intentionally put in the public sphere once certain groups of people wanted to perpetuate this whole idea of the lost cause. I mean, it's having access to that information is key. And, and I feel like that does help the conversation, but you have to also have the willingness to hear the information first. Uh, which I think is something that's very personal. And uh, it, it seems at least from what I observe that a lot of that is actually generational. Um, people of my parents' generation, actually a lot of their textbooks were, and I'm sorry, I'm realizing I'm a little backlit. Um, their textbooks were actually often written by the daughters of the Confederacy. So, and, and there's a lot of evidence for this. And I delve into a little bit of that in my literature review. Um, but when your education from your childhood is shaped by people who are invested in this, you know, story that's been created over time, then it's going to change your willingness to even hear the information to begin with. Thanks so much. I really liked your presentation. Oh, good. I'm, I'm, I'm glad to hear that because I was like, oh, how am I going to condense this? I think it was great. Oh, it was, yeah, I would agree with uh, Sarah that uh, it was a, a great presentation and, it, and I could tell that you were condensing a, a lot of research. So thank yeah, you for doing that. Um, what's uh, a question I have is maybe um, your sense living there practically as a, as a citizen of the South. Um, and you mentioned, you know, your parents' generation. I mean, do you, are you seeing in, in uh, let's say, uh, whites, uh, of your, your generation or younger that that shift is happening? It does feel like there's a shift in my generation where people are more willing to hear this information. Um, but that could also be because that's how my friend group is. Those are the people I surround myself with. So I feel like I would need to do a little bit more research to make sure that's accurate because I mean, there, there are definitely people who I know who are my age, who, who disagree with this. There are people my age who are Confederate reenactors and they are very invested in this story. Um, as, as part of a former job I had, um, I was around a lot of Confederate reenactors and I even had to go to a, where I, I did because I didn't really have to, but I, I, I ended up at a Sons of Confederacy meeting and it's, it's fascinating. I was really actually hoping to interview some people from that group for, for this paper and it just didn't pan out. Um, but one example I'll give, even going to that Sons of Confederacy meeting um, is they recite the Confederate Pledge of Allegiance and then immediately follow it with the Pledge of Allegiance to the United States of America. And I kind of go, don't these two conflict with each other? And I really want to have that conversation because I, I mean, I, for me, at least as a researcher, I really want to know, like, what is the thought process behind this? And I can almost promise you that the answer is probably, well, this is just how we've always done it. And it's probably just goes that far. Um, and it's just part of our history. And a lot of people, I feel like, say it's just part of our history, but then don't necessarily take it, take their analysis any further. And, um, and they genuinely don't believe that this is potentially hurting anybody.
Thank you. Um, other other questions? We have a few minutes left uh, for questions for Molly. Yeah, I do, Molly. Great to see your work being presented here. Hi, thank you. Um, yeah, and I ducked in a little late because I was looking, I wanted to be at Raoul's as well. So, um, so it's interesting, you know, Georgia is on, was on the front line tip of the spear, really, in the 2020 election and the kind of work that you're doing and the people that you're supporting. Um, seemingly, the small things are having a profound impact nationally and internationally now. And yet, uh, these interrelated issues of Southern identity um, are tied to a story that came out today, which really looks at like it's the, the title and some of the more left leaning outlets is Jim Crow 2.0 in terms of very significant legislation that's being passed by Republican legislators to suppress voting rights. Um, in the context of your study, as well as some of the cultural shifts that are happening and the reactions that are happening in, in response to that. Um, can you speculate to see where that's going in the state of Georgia in the next two to four years? So I have a lot of friends who are really fighting on the grassroots level, who are working for New Georgia Project, who are, are really just hands-on with this. And I think from what I can observe, um, it, there's, there's a lot of small grassroots, local level people who are like, all right, time to get back to work. It's, we're not going to give up um, and uh, we're going to get right in this. And I think, um, I think that that will make a difference. The other thing that's happening here in Georgia, and I would say this happened probably elsewhere as well, is um, gerrymandering. So when you've got a lot of gerrymandering, you're going to get a lot of people in office who may not truly represent the majority of people. So you end up with a Marjorie Taylor Greene elected where she is because of stuff like that, but maybe she doesn't truly represent what, you know, may be otherwise drawn in her district if it were, and I don't know that her district specifically is gerrymandered. I just know that this is an issue in Georgia. It's, it's it'll, it'll be interesting to see where it goes, but I have a lot of friends who are right there in it and they're not giving up. So wow. I just want to give a shout out to New Georgia Project and, and people like them, because I know they are if you're on Instagram, go follow them on Instagram. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, no thank you. Um, I, we, we've kind of run out of, out of time, but I just wanted to, on behalf of all of us, just thank you for uh, how 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 well you presented this uh, research that you did and how relevant is it, it is uh, to what's going on right now. And so that's a real real uh, um, compliment, and not only you, but to the Communication and Leadership Studies Program for uh, having you work through this research. Just got to get it published now. <laughs> it is going to get published, or it... no, I need to try and get it published. I got to. Yes. Like, the next you should time. be able to. It's a very, it's a very good, it's very relevant. It's very important, I think, uh, for what's going on right now. So, well, I thank, have to say, Dr. Hazel was a big thank help. you, uh, Molly McWilliams Wilkins, and uh, uh, and. Uh, uh, for your presentation. Thank you all for joining uh, us in this presentation and, and enjoy the rest of the Leadership Symposium. Thanks so much. Thanks, Molly. Thank you.